Today on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, you will learn how to make an ironing board table. The Appalachian area is comprised of 13 eastern states covering 205,000 square miles of rugged, mountainous terrain. It stretches from New York to Mississippi, with West Virginia being the only state totally encased in the area. When this region was first settled, the immigrants had to travel over the Appalachian mountain range with only what they could carry or haul by wagons. They would make furniture and other wooden items that were necessary and functional. When I was a kid, and I remember us doing laundry, I helped with it as, as well. Uh, we had a coal uh, stove, and not, not, we didn't use wood, we used coal. And we would use that copper boiler, we filled it with water, set it on, and we'd get the water very hot, I think boiling. We put our white clothes in that. And so that's what, that's how we use it. And we always refer to it as a copper boiler. I've seen in antique stores where they had a set of tongs to get the clothes out of the hot water tank. And you all didn't use this. No, we, we were backwoodsy, I guess. <laughs> uh, we used a stick, or it may have been a broomstick. Uh, I'm not sure, but I remember, you know, putting that in, lifting it over into into our Maytag washer. And that was so you wouldn't burn your hands. <laughs> right. Yes, because it was very hot. We just had our Maytag ringer washer. We had, uh, you know, a wash tub with the uh, the rinse water. Yeah. And uh, so you know, we would wash it there, and then we would run it through the the ringer. Yeah put it over in the, the rinse water. So once you put it through the wringer to get the uh, soapy water out, then you put it in the rinse water. Rinse, and then it was rinsed and put in the basket, taken outside and hung on the clothesline. A lot of our clothes would be starched, and uh, so I would uh, sprinkle them just to dampen them down so that they would be ready to iron, uh, maybe that evening or the next day. We started out with the white clothes, and and uh, of course, then your I think the sheets and and uh, our colored clothes were last. Then the very last thing that we did was our rags that we cleaned with, or rugs or something, and that went in the last wash. Yeah. Of course, by that time it was getting a little soiled, so we didn't use a lot of water. You all would also spend almost a whole day ironing. I didn't spend a whole day. Carolyn, I'd like to thank you and Odie for allowing us to video here on your farm in Mason County, West Virginia. Uh, also for allowing us to use some of your old antique laundry equipment. The Columbus Washable Company was going to go out of business in 1999. Um, we saw a, um, an advertisement in the Columbus Dispatch saying that the company was going to close um, and one of my business partners basically went to the original factory in Grandview and he just said, you know, look, you know, we'll just buy you lock, stock and barrel um, and they put um, all of it into several semis and, and drove it here to Logan um, and then set everything up. So everything that you see here pretty much is all from the original factory in Grandview. So all of these carts and everything, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't made them look old, they are old. Basically, um, we have uh, the original equipment and then we have um, the more efficient equipment. What this does is it puts the finger joints in. So when we get our wood, um, it comes to us from a company in Lowellville and it's a high poplar, so it's all um, as much as we can get locally sourced. They will cut and shape the wood for us and then we put the finger joints in. To do that, it's very simple process of just pushing it in like that or pushing it in like that to make us more efficient we can actually do the same process of the um, of the finger joints and we can just put two dozen of these in at one go and just slide it through. We have um, two washboard sizes which is family and pail size. Mm -hmm. um, the pail size obviously is intended to fit into a bucket you right. can take it away on vacation um, but we also do a mini which actually is a scaled version of a washboard. As I'm sure you know, a lot of these companies, particularly of our age, they would have very specific equipment to do the job and then when, when people don't know how to use it or if it breaks down, they go out of business. We are removing that obsolescence from everything that we're doing. I noticed you started with the groove in the board. That's right, yeah. 
that it comes in that way? That's already been cut and okay. shaped, yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I said, that's a high O poplar. Um, at some points we were using teak, um, but when I came over, um, I wanted to do an inventory on all of our suppliers, um, and I wanted everything from the USA wherever possible. Surely people don't use them anymore. Well, actually, yeah, they do. They use them more than they did 15 years ago. You can use a washboard just for stain removal. So just a little bit of soap, a bit of water, rub it on the um, stain, and then throw it in the washer, and that's it. Okay, so I'm going to start out by taking one of the sides, which we call the legs, and the top, which we call our head, and attach the two at the finger joints. Lay it in the press. We have a foot pedal, and that will press the piece together. I'm going to put our brain board in and our top rail, press it together, put a piece of metal in, and a bottom rail, now I'm going to put the other leg on and line it up. Now I'm going to tap my finger join in. It's nailed in six places. And that's all there is. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery. In woodworking, you need to know how to safely use your equipment. When creating dust, make certain you have good cross ventilation, a dust collection system, or a dust respirator. If you're applying a finish, please use a NIOSH approved respirator for that particular chemical. A good set of hearing protection is necessary to protect your hearing. And of course, eye protection is a must. Today, in the Appalachian Heritage Wood Shop, I'm going to be converting an ironing board to a coffee table. Rather than disassembling an antique ironing board, I will be building a new one from Riff Song White Oak. I'm going to begin by cross cutting some oak boards to the proper length. When you're cross cutting boards, you always want to cut off the first few inches because you will have checks in the end where it has dried. When you cross cut an end, it's good to pound it on a surface and that'll tell you if there's any checks and if there is, you'll need to cut more off. This one's good. You also need to check and see if the board has any cup to it. If it has a cup, you put the concave side down. If the convex side was down, then the board would rock as you're pushing it through the joint. Okay, now I am ready to edge joint. Now that I've jointed one edge straight, I can use it against the fence to rip a parallel edge to the jointed edge. And I want to measure each board and see what to set. This one will be five and a half inches. And then open my dust collection. And I'm ready to go. So now that I've got all the boards dimension, I need to lay them out and get the best grain. We need to spend just a little bit of time and get the grain to where it matches the best. I have plenty of width so I can cut out some of these defects. So I'm looking at the defects. I see a knot here, which I will cut out. I got some black stuff here I don't like, so I want to cut that out. 
You need to look at both sides of the board. This, I don't like this fungus on there at all. But I think, I think it'll work like that because the ironing board shape will be coming in and I can kept, cut that out as waste. I'm ready to glue up my boards now. I put a carpenter's triangle on it to mark which face is up and to position them where I want them. And I'm deliberately having this one stick down so I can cut this knot out. And I've got this uh, bad place here and I believe that will cut off when I shape it the way I want. If you can draw an imaginary line at a 45 degree angle from the head of the clamp, where it comes to the first intersection of the two boards, that will show you where the clamp pressure is for that clamp. You want to position the clamps so that you have even pressure all along your joints. That will determine the number of clamps as well. I like to put clamps on the bottom and the top of the boards because as you apply clamping pressure, if you have them on the top and bottom, it will even out the pressure and less likely to bow. I prefer to apply glue with my fingers and I like to glue both surfaces to ensure I get an adequate amount of glue to get a successful bond. This has a very short open time, so I've got to work fairly quickly. As I slowly tighten the clamp up, I look at the surfaces to make sure they're made it up properly. And this is one of the big advantages of cave clamps. It gives you a flat surface underneath to ensure they stay flat. And if you've jointed the boards properly, you shouldn't have an issue. I've taken this out of the clamps. I've scraped the glue off with the carbide scraper and run it through the planer so it's dimensioned the way I want. Now to get the shape that I want, from this end I come in three inches, set my compass at three inches, and make an arc. And then I, from there I come down 22 inches and square across. And then it's just a matter of connecting the two points and drawing a straight line. So now I need to cut this shape out right here. For this application, I'm just going to use the jigsaw. When using a jigsaw, always be aware of what's under the board you're cutting so you don't make a mistake and cut something you don't want to cut. What I need to do now is uh, reposition it. The end of the ironing board, instead of having it square, it looks too abrupt. I like to do a very, very slight contour on it. So I'm going to mark that and cut it while I've got the jigsaw here. Okay, the way I like to mark a small contour is with a flexible piece of wood. So I'm going to measure back one inch on each end. I put the clamp right on that one inch mark and it's just a matter of bowing the wood till you get it where you want it and then hold it and mark it. And that's the shape I want. Now I just need to do some sanding on the edges uh, and then get a router and a profile and I route the edge I want. I'm going to round over the top and bottom edge with a quarter inch round over bit. I laid the first ironing board on top of the second one and used it for a pattern to mark where to cut. But before I do, I've noticed there's a lot of worm holes full of sawdust. So using some ice pick and a brush, I need to get that sawdust out. And then I'll cut this one just like I did the first one. Since this is right on the edge, it doesn't matter whether I use a plunge router or a fixed base router on this, I'm gonna use a fixed base. Here I have end grain, so I wanna do the end grain first. So if I have any tear out, it gets cleaned up when I do the long grain. When using a router, keep a firm grip on the router and move at a constant steady pace.
Now I need to cut the bottom of the washboard legs at 55 degrees so that I can use the washboards as a spacer between the top and bottom of the table. I made a jig right here to hold it securely. For this, I pivoted the guard out of the way and got the piece clamped in there and my hands will stay out of the way and I'm ready to make a cut. When using a large item like this on a sled, I like to clamp it in place so it cannot move. And remember, keep your hands out of harm's way. To attach the washboards together, a biscuit 20, 10, or 0 size is too large. So I'm going to use an R2, which is the size you usually use for a picture frame. I've already got my mark there. I'm going to start with a block like this. Cut it, drill the center hole, and end up with one like this right here. Use a chisel to turn a block of wood perfectly round. Use a set of calipers to get the proper diameter. Mark the top of the bun foot. And here you can see I had to change for a smaller chisel to get the shoulder on the top of the bun foot. Be sure and round over the edges. Get a nice contour. Use sandpaper to smooth the wood and get rid of the chisel marks. Be careful that the sandpaper doesn't grab and pull your hand into the lathe. I like to burnish the wood with sawdust after I've sanded. I used a template and a propane torch to burn the wood. Okay, the finish is dried on my washboard coffee table. Now I'm going to go ahead and assemble it. So you can see how it goes together. I'm going to start with the bun feet. Put the they just screw right in to the threaded inserts. This uh, is also a good way of being able to level up a table. Uh, no matter how bad the floor is out of level. Now I want to install my washboard. I prefer to completely assemble a project including all the hardware and then disassemble it then apply the finish. When I reassemble it, I always use just a hand screwdriver, never a uh, power drill. Put everything together before I apply the finish. I put everything together and then took it apart and then applied the finish. So now putting it together, I prefer just to use a hand driver and not an electric driver. Way I don't over tighten them. If you do use an electric driver, make sure you use the clutch. I like to use a square drive screw. In this case, it is countersunk. Uh, the square drive screw gives you more torque. I also use a self-tapping screw. That way I only have to drill a clearance hole through the first piece, in this case the washboard. Then the screw will tap its own hole into the bottom of the ironing board. When reassembling, a lot of times it's a little bit difficult to get the holes lined up just right. You just got to take a little bit of time. 
once you get it lined up, the screws will thread in real easy. When inserting the screws, I like to tighten them till you hear the wood creak. That means it's grabbing and, and tightening real good. Take the time to make sure the screw is aligned with the hole before you tighten it. It's wise to align all the screws before you tighten any of the screws. Then go back and tighten all the screws. Of course, you got to make certain that the screws are not too long so they don't protrude out the top of the table. It'd be terrible to get this far along in the project and have the screws stick through the top. You can see a slight gap between the base and the top. With the clearance hole in the base, this will allow the top to pull down tight to the base. Now you can hear the screw grabbing and pulling the wood tight. In this case, the washboards will flex enough as the top of the coffee table expands and contracts. So I'm not concerned about the wood splitting or cracking. After all the screws are installed, go back and tighten all of them and you can hear the wood creak as it gets tight. There you have the oak washboard coffee table. Thanks for watching the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. For more information on today's project, go to AppalachianHeritageWoodshop.com. Be proud of your Appalachian heritage. The Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services. Common sense internet marketing and web design. Our internet marketing commissions are based on results. Robinson and Mackle, thinking business, practicing law. Heritage Farm Museum and Village. Experience the past, appreciate today, dream for the future.